yes, hello to anybody who doesn't know me. Um, so um, I've been interested in butterflies and moths as long as I can remember, really. Um, and since I've been up here in Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen, which has been about the last oh, 20, 20, going on 25 years, I suppose. So I've done a lot of recording of um, butterflies and moths up here. So some I know very well, others I don't know so well, but, um, but I'm going to include today probably most of our um, resident and regular migrant butterfly species and a selection of day fly moths as well. So lots of things to look out for. So looking forward to the weather warming up, um, which will encourage, um, encourage them to come out. So without further ado, so I'm just going to run through and, and it, I've got name the species names, the common names, captions there. So so if for any reason the audio does stop, at least you can see what I'm talking about if you don't, don't recognise the, the species. So um, I'm sure many of you, um, if not all of you, will have seen peacock butterflies up here um, in Aberdeenshire. Um, but if I'd been doing this talk perhaps, you know, a couple of decades or more ago, then would have been a very different story and we now almost take it for granted that peacocks it's one of our commonest butterflies one of the first to emerge out of hibernation in early spring um, but it's it's um, one that's doing well and it has spread up from the <clears throat> from the south but now certainly very well established here uh, and overwintering um, there's stunning eye spots of course but then it can equally the the um, butterfly on the top of the picture there with the wings closed up so it can also look very camouflaged when it wants to. And if you're out near any nettle patches then a bit later on in the year um, <clears throat> in the summer you can sometimes find the caterpillars um, and they, they like to have big nettle beds and they're quite often in the you know in the middle of patches as well so probably not always that easy to find them but when you do find them you can find lots and lots of them they're very gregarious and um and the, also you can see lots of the droppings as well that they've left behind um but nettles being found in all sorts of places then the peacocks you know very good at spreading and uh, finding for these food sources and they're a close relative is the small tortoiseshell. Um, so I've actually started off with, with a caterpillar picture. So they're very spiky as well, which is probably a good defense against um, birds or other predators to at least to some extent. Um, but the small tortoiseshell, you can usually see those yellow stripes along the caterpillars, um, which the peacocks don't, don't have. And occasionally I don't often find them, but you know, if you have a um, a look of nettles or nearby and sometimes you can be lucky enough to find a, a chrysalis um, which are just you know beautiful in themselves and here of course is the small tortoiseshell um, a picture in the late summer <clears throat> nectaring on the ice plant which is a really good nectar source um, for later in the year and then the comma so the comma is certainly a more recent arrival or rather one that has recolonized much of Scotland. Um, so I would still say it's, it's relatively scarce up here in Aberdeenshire. So I don't know how many of you may have, may have seen a comma up here, um, but I, I'm certainly at least seeing one or two every year now. D side, most of D side, you can find them, you know, in various spots along there. Um, but up into the north of the Shire as well, they, they have been seen. And even in the last couple of years, um, a few people have been finding caterpillars, both on nettles and also on elm. So it's an interesting butterfly because it's actually changed and adapted to use different food plants. And it, it used to be known as the, the hopworm many years ago and down the hop fields, places like Kent down in the southeast of England, and it was considered a pest. Um, on the hops um, because the, that's what the caterpillars would be eating um, but it's been known to be also an elm feeder for a long long time but nettles seems to be a more recent adaptation um, and of course the comma if you didn't already know um, then it has the little white comma mark on the underside 
um, but it's wonderfully camouflaged like a um, an old dead leaf really so it's um, yeah looks like it's been tattered and torn but that's just how it's meant to be and then also in this same group of butterflies is the red admiral um, which is probably another familiar butterfly to many of you and it's a regular migrant here and we think possibly there has been a few early sightings like certainly as early as March up here which suggests it might be overwintering in some milder winters or you know in certain places um, or at least not not far away if you go down to the south of England now it can be one of the first butterflies that people see down there like even in January on mild days and they'll they'll appear out of hibernation um, so that's one that's you know possibly could we could be seeing more of the early sightings in the year and occasionally I've come across caterpillars as well so it's, it's another nettle feeder um, and uh, and this one was actually about to pupate, so it's just started sort of suspending itself from under a, a leaf there, getting ready to change into its um, pupil skin. And the Painted Lady, um, we had a close, close relative, the Red Admiral. Um, we get some years where you hardly see any, um, but I think my two th 2019, I think was the last really good migration year um, and I remember one day and seeing one appear outside my garden I went out to the first thing in the morning and then later in the day was down at Duffy Park um, doing an event down there for butterfly conservation and um, gradually started seeing oh there's a painted lady there's another painted lady and, and there'd been a huge invasion um, that that day or even overnight sometimes they will if they're migrating will fly during the night time and went for a walk down at the, the coast near cove afterwards and there was just hundreds if not thousands of painted ladies all over the place and in this country they're laying their eggs on thistles is the usual food plant um, but they will use other other different plants as well but it's only in yeah the last few years where it's been discovered that they're starting their migration um, um, well that they are able to make a return migration back to to Africa so to places like the Atlas Mountains and even beyond that so some come from sub-Saharan Africa so their migration everybody knows about the monarch migration is quite famous but the Painted Lady the actual the total migration from is I think an even actually even longer for where as long as they get for even further north than um, than our area so incredible really um, but when they make their return migration they're actually using um, air currents at high altitudes so that's why they were not being seen before um, often going back the other direction um, but they've been picked up on radar because these huge clouds of butterflies that, that radar can detect now some fritillaries um, for you, uh, dark green fritillary. Uh, this is a mating pair here. The female has got the boulder markings, so she's there on, on the top, top of the picture, and the, the male underneath her. So sometimes butterflies, when they're busy doing something else like this, then they can be quite easy to approach. Obviously, you don't want to disturb them and you know cause them to separate, but uh, you know, just by kind of creeping in slowly and was able to get this this picture i think this is at marone burkwood um, in braemar but the reason for the dark green in the name is because of the underside um, so it's this kind of olive green background color and these lovely white um, pearly markings on there and this was a freshly emerged female again she was probably still actually drying her wings so it was very easy to approach but so often i've had so many unsuccessful attempts trying to photograph these butterflies that you know when it's they're out in the sun and yeah they're, they're off and away. Um, the fritillaries, most of the fritillaries and all the ones in our area feed on violets as caterpillars um, so anywhere where you find the dog violets in particular um, but some of them will use marsh violet as well um, you can find these butterflies so this is the most widespread one. Small pearl bordered um, 
It's still quite quite widespread up here. It's a species that's declined in some places down in the south of England, but thankfully we've, they're still doing very well here. You tend to find these in damper habitats. Um, so this is one that will lay its eggs on the marsh violet typically. But yeah, re really stunning little butterfly. Um, and this one flies sort of, well, sometimes from late May, but more into June, into July, sometimes into August. Um, so the dark green fritillary starts a little bit later, sort of late June and through July into August. But now just to compare two very similar species. So, so this is just an underside picture because it's easiest to tell from the underside between these two. So small pearl bordered on the left and pearl bordered on the right. So the pearl bordered is the first one actually to emerge in spring. So sometimes even from late April up here, but typically more into the mi middle of May is when we start to see them. And they can go on usually until the end of June um, is, is when they go on to. So the flight periods overlap and you can sometimes find them in the same um, habitats or the habitats will overlap. The pearl border prefers drier habitats um, and but yeah you can often get them side by side so if you look closely at these pictures so they do, do look quite different the small pearl bordered is much more contrasting overall in appearance and the underside and it has these um, around the pearls around the border hence the names you get the black edge um, pearls on the small pearl the pearl bordered it's this this lovely chestnut brown color so then there's, there's, there's just a lot more black in the small pearl bordered and the big the spot that um, is in one of the um, orange colored cells on the wings there is bigger in the small pearl bordered um, and it also has more um, paler marks I guess the small pearl bordered than the pearl bordered but you know I've seen examples that are less obvious or maybe if they're a bit a bit worn but uh, um, but yeah, you can tell them apart. And this picture here, I just wanted to include this one um, of this pearl bordered. So it's sitting just on a mud patch here. Um, there may have been some animal feces around, but what it's doing, it's actually feeding and, and taking up mineral salts. And this is something you, you may be associate sort of tropical butterflies and you might have seen pictures of butterflies doing this sort of mud puddling but butterflies here in this country do that to some extent um, and they're getting these essential minerals which is thought that they maybe need to be able to mate successfully and sometimes the male will be passing on certain substances to the female during mating and here's a mating pair of pearl borders here this was at canvas of may um, so the female is the lower one here and the male slightly brighter orange at the top. So when they're first freshly emerged, they do look, you know, really lovely, bright, bright orange. And that's another thing when you get the, an overlap and you might have small, small pearl borders coming out. And by the time they're coming out, the pearl borders are often starting to look a bit faded. And then you see these bright, bright orange, um, small pearl borders. There's, there's really no difference in size. So the small is a bit of a, a misnomer really. And just a little bit more about the habitat because this one, this pearl bordered is much more restricted, but we're very lucky that we've got, have got lots of good habitat here. D side is its stronghold. So there's one or two spots on Don side, but it's mainly D side. We have them here. So the caterpillars, so the caterpillar up there in the top left, um, so they munch away on the violet leaves, also the flowers, that one was eating a flower. Um, so they'd be around actually out feeding now at this time of year when the weather's a bit better, <laughs> they'll come out um, on a decent day um, and they'll sunbathe because they need to sunbathe to be able to digest their food. So even on a relatively cool spring day, if the sun's out, they can bask in the sun and absorb the heat with the black bodies. Um, and then they can digest their meal properly. So the microclimate is very, very important for this butterfly. So some places you can find at some of the south facing riverbanks, um, so like near Cambus May, 
um, and way leaves where you've got the telegraph that the um, or power lines going through has just created actually a perfect habitat where you've got the slope typically south facing sheltered by the conifers either side to some extent and as long as the bracken's not too thick so the picture the picture on the bottom right there is a Taboyne loch um, but some of the bracken there is, is just really too dense and thick but there are other patches um, that, that are fine and the violets can can come through um, so yeah there are lots of places when you know when to, when to look you can find them so another spring butterfly the orange tip um, so very distinctive the male with the orange wing tips of course um, and this one's perched on cuckoo flower which was worm one of its larval food plants and here's a mating pair um, and the male's up on the top and just see the, the orange um, bit on his wing showing through there. So the female doesn't have the orange but has the same underside pattern which is, is really beautiful and a good way of, of being camouflaged when they want to be. But you can also look for this butterfly even on a you know a day that's not very good for seeing butterflies flying but you can find the eggs so once you're you know they've been out out a little while um so i don't know if you can see the egg in this picture right bang in the middle of this flower so this is dame's violet which is a sort of garden escape really um and it's quite widely naturalized um in in some of our area but yeah the orange tips will easily use this so it's not just cuckoo flower but some of the other um, flowers in the crucifer family so garlic mustard is another one that's commonly used um, usually you only have one egg laid per flower because the caterpillars are known to be cannibalistic by people that have tried rearing them so <laughs> but sometimes I've, I've found cuckoo flowers with several eggs laid where maybe there's just a shortage of food plant and the butterfly just needs to it will just lay them anyway and hopefully at least one of them will will survive maybe eat, eat some of the others along the way. So the orange tip is one of the, our white butterflies really it's, it's in that family um, but the green veined white is our commonest white in our area um, and it's not one of the cabbage whites so <laughs> so you can always tell people moan about cabbage whites so well most of our whites are not eating cabbages so so it has these um, dark greeny or even blackish looking veins. Um, it's just when you're looking close up, it's just like, you know, it's sort of speckled. The scales are, um, some of the scales and the wings just got these, these um, dusting to them. Um, so that's the, hence the, the green, green veined here. So I think this is the female here that's on the left with the wings closed. The male is slightly tattered with the wings open there. Now this is um, a couple of small wipes here. This was actually taken, I, was, I think it was zoomed in from quite a long way. So, so it's not as, as sharp as it could be, but it was kind of an interesting shot. Um, I think it was at Castle Fraser. So the butterfly that's resting on, on the flower here, you can, can you see her abdomen's poking up? And this is a female actually, you, you might say it looks like she's inviting him to come along, but it's actually a, saying I've, I've mated already, go away kind of posture. So if you see, see butterflies doing this, that's, that's usually what it means. Um, and so the male will eventually give up and go, go elsewhere. So the small white is our least common white species here. It's the first one usually to emerge in spring. So I know there have been reports, there has been some seen already. I know to Tony who's, who's on, he's, he's seen one. Um, towards the, during that warm spell we had at the end of March. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's the one that's um, the least common up here. The large white um, is uh, quite a common migrant up here as well as it is a resident species. So, you know, they do overwinter here in the chrysalis stage uh, as with the, the other whites as well. Um, but you do get some just get big influxes, so they'll sometimes arrive when painted ladies and red admirals do as well. Um, 
so this is this one along with the small white is, is a cabbage white so there's a, a caterpillar picture there on the right too and these are very strong strong powerful flyers as well and bigger than the the other two the other whites now this is probably one of my personal favorites certainly the butterflies in spring um a green hair streak um and the green color is actually um it's not the pigment it's actually the colors that we see from the with well, the way that the light is actually re refracting um the, to due to the structure of the scales that cover the whole wings of, of the butterfly um but yeah it's just just a stunning butterfly and they're quite tiny really so they're easily overlooked but on a nice sunny day and if the peak of the season um and you might see several of these i remember doing a walk around craig leak um up in record one day just the sort of walk around the hill and counted about 100 odd green hair streaks and that that walk just it was just at the right time on a good day and this one's nectaring on blaberry and blaberry is the usual food plant up here so they do use other plants in, in other areas but like like gorse but uh um but blaberry is the the main food plant here so that's one to look out to come into next um well even this month if the weather picks up enough and certainly into may and, and june as well now this is the exciting story so we thought we only had green hair streaks among the hair streaks up here in the northeast until january when um a chap called Patrick Cook. So he's a ecologist with butterfly conservation, and he now lives lives in the area. So he's been out looking for eggs of the purple hair streak, but not really expecting to find any up here. So the nearest known sites are down in in Angus and, and Perthshire, but yeah, quite a way for to um, big jump up here. But anyway, he started looking during the winter. And New Canvas May found some eggs um, on low branches of oaks and also some fallen twigs. So after all the storms that we've had over the winter, so it's actually been quite a good winter to look. So even on oak trees where there's no accessible branches, if you find some fallen twigs, then you can go and look. So I eventually managed to find a couple of eggs myself and another spot near, near Canvas May. Um, and so far they've only been found yeah in that sort of area and up to just the other side of Ballater as well so people have been looking further down the D. so the purple hair streak it, the female will lay at various levels on the tree but she will find a nice plump plump oak buds is what she needs so oak is is the food plant and when the caterpillar first hatches it will bore into an oak bud um, and then later it will feed outside as the leaves start to come out and the caterpillar will be feeding on the leaves later on. So this is a butterfly, um, a, a picture of the purple hair street butterfly that I took down in down in Wiltshire where my parents stay. So um, so I have seen them down south. Well I have seen them in Perthshire as well, but uh, this is one I took last summer when we were down visiting. So this is a typical view that you might get of a purple hair streak. And, um, so it's just peeking out there from behind it. I think it would come down on an ash, maybe feeding on honeydew. Um, so they don't really visit flowers very much. And they spend nearly all their times up in the treetops, which is probably why if they have been on these side for some time, they could be easily overlooked. Now I know some of us have looked in places before, um, but, uh, but the time to look is in the um, early early evening, say between roughly between six and eight pm. Um, probably more likely to into August up in our area. So certainly a few of us are going to be going out and scanning the tops of oak trees with binoculars on a nice evening, summer's evening. Now the next slide has got a wee video which hopefully will work um, to kind of show you what to what to look for. So this is another video actually taken in. Wiltshire a few years ago, but they're doing just the same thing here. So let's see if this will play. So look at the top of the picture. Can you see a little silver disc spinning around? So 
So what happens is the males will are very territorial. So a lot of butterflies are territorial. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I'll just keep playing that till I finish speaking. Um, so if one male decides to come up and moves and then encroaches on somebody else's territory and that can then cause a fight and then you start to see the butterflies spinning around, you'll, have, you know, you'll see this and other butterflies as well. And it's often these males that are, are, are dueling. Um, <clears throat> but here there must be at least half a dozen there that were um, all going around and <laughs> flying together. So that's what you're looking for. You're peering at the tops of oak trees and, and looking for these little silvery butterflies spinning around. So the underside, it does actually look quite, quite silvery. Right, so let's try and get out of this. <clears throat> okay, so small copper, another lovely stunning butterfly to spot in spring. And then again, in late summer, autumn. So it has two generations in the year. And some of our uh, ones up here have these lovely little blue spots just on the hind wings as well. Um, so a really, really beautiful butterfly. So they lay their eggs on uh, common sorrel is, is the food plant. And then also in this, this, this same group with the hair streaks and the, and the coppers and the blues, um, the common blue. So what a stunning butterfly. Um, so this is the male. So his four uh, wings are uh, completely, what we see this iridescent blue color. And then the female, um, our females up here in Scotland can be look quite blue as well. So, so if you go down south, then they're not always nearly as blue as that on the upper side. Um, but you also see the, the orange speckles around the wing edges as well. So, so actually both those photos were taken in a, a late um, summer um, emergence and they were on this uh, devil's bit scabious. But the food plant for the caterpillar is the, um, usually the common uh, bird's foot trefoil. And so I have once found a caterpillar, but they're, they're very well camouflaged. So it's always sort of slightly slug-like um, looking beast. Um, but yes, yeah, so any, anywhere where you've got bird's foot trefoil growing, then you, you know, the chances are the common blues will be there. And just to compare um, two species here, the common blue northern brown argus, which can look quite similar underneath, and you might find them in the same sorts of habitats, you know, gra grassland areas. Um, so at a first glance, they look very similar, but the common blue has always got the, the black spots um, like little mini eyes, um, and the northern brown argus doesn't have that, just, just these white spots on there. So that's a key difference. The northern brown argus is also smaller, so the way these photos are shown is probably actually approximately to, to scale. So here's the northern brown argus and upper side, so it's got this white Patch, patch here on the forewing. So that's another characteristic here um, that the Northern Brown Argus has. <clears throat> but they're restricted to places where rock rose grows. So that's their only food plant. Um, and rock rose being associated with sort of lime, limey rocks. Um, so there, there are quite a lot of pockets in D side, but over on Don side as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, if you find this plant, then the chances are there could be a northern brown argus colony. Even even a, a tiny patch of rock crows can support a little colony. And this is another butterfly. You can look for the eggs. Um, they're usually laid on the top surfaces of the leaf. Um, so just wee white round eggs. So they though they're, they're very tiny, but they do stand out on the leaf. So that's a good way to, to survey for these butterflies. And small blue, which isn't actually particularly blue. The, the males do have a little bit of a blue sheen, but they're almost more gray than blue. But they are very, very tiny little butterflies. Um, not many places now that we can see this one in the northeast. They used to be more inland colonies that some of these have fortunately 
the habitat was lost over time. So they rely on kidney vetch as the caterpillar food plant. So some of the best places to see this is up on the Bampshire coast um, and uh, places like um, around Port Soy and Port, Port Nocky is a good place near, near the Bow Fiddle Rock um, and some of the, the grassland there with kidney vetch. So and May and June is, is the time to, to see this little butterfly. Another very much coastal butterfly up here is the grayling. And, um, and this is a typical grayling pose, but if it really wants to hide, it tucks down the forewing with the showing the eye spot. And then you think, where's that? Where's it gone? And you can't see it because it's just camouflaged on, on the rocks. And they do this kind of leaning in against the rock to maximize getting the, the warmth from the sunshine. But they, they never open their wings out though. They're always, when they're when at rest, always clo closed up like this. Um, there's some suggestion that the graylings may be declining. So certainly from places that are monitored further south, there does seem to be evidence for that. Um, but we, we certainly still have them around the around quite a bit of our coast here. Um, so yeah, lovely one of the browns. So yes, yeah, so we're kind of in the kind of brown group of butterflies now, if you like. They're all um feeders on grasses as caterpillars, some on, you know, more particular species than others, but uh, um, but grasses or their um, relatives. So small heath here on the left, large heath on the right. So again, just to compare, because it's, you might see these sometimes in the same places. Um, so small heath is very much, you know, um, open grassland, butterfly. Large heath is restricted to bogs, but some as you where you've got those sort of habitats side by side, close proximity, you could see, see both of them. So large heath was still quite widespread in our uplands, um, but we don't know if there are still any remaining in a lot of our the lowland bogs, so some up in the northeast corner. There are going to be some surveys again this year. Um, but yeah, some of them perhaps if the habitat has dried out too much, we could have lost these. As the large heath, it's it's actually the cotton grass, so which is because it's, it's the sedge rather than the grass, but uh, and usually the hare's tail cotton grass is is its caterpillar food plant. And you'll find them nectaring. This one's on tormental, um, but they'll use um cross-leaved heath as one of the favorite food plants, which of course is, you'll find on the bogs. So small heath, but is, is pretty widespread though. A meadow brown um, can be fairly common in some of our lowland grassland areas here. Um, this one's nectaring on bramble. That's certainly a favorite, favorite food source. Um, so alongside hedgerows as well. And Scotch Argus. So Yes, we've got lots of good sites for this. Um, and I remember when I, I worked um, as a ranger, seasonal ranger at Balmoral for a few years. And sometimes you just used to see hundreds of these around the castle grounds. Um, so this is one of the latest ones to emerge. So grayling is, is a late summer species, but it's got Chagas as well. So at the end of July, going into to August is when you, you'll see them. And they can look almost black when they're freshly emerged. You just see these very, very dark butterflies flying around the, <clears throat> the grasslands. But yeah, beautiful. And of course, all these brown butterflies, they've all you know, you've got these eye spots to a greater or lesser extent. So what I didn't say about the large heath, actually, it was the, after the form we get up here, the eye spots are almost absent. Um, and it has this, we think, a strategy. It's hiding from predators more than showing these false eyes to deter predators. Um, and ringlet um, is another of the browns. And here, I think we've got female here on the left. And this is a form of ringlet that has the eye spots just reduced to these little white spots here. So that's um, not, not that uncommon to see that, um, but the typical form in the <clears throat> male here on the right. So that's where it gets its name. They're like these, these are the ringlets. 
And last one, I think, of our butterflies here is the speckled wood. And this is another so success story up here. Um, it really has made it inroads up the glens. Um, so it's certainly way up, up D side now. Um, it's another one you go back 10 years or more ago and they were very scarce up here. But this is an interesting because they're not just moving up from the south, but also some have been moving from the Murray Firth area, which has got the sort of milder microclimate. So there's maybe actually two populations meeting in the middle somewhere. Um, but yeah, a lot of woodlands now an area you can, you can expect to see this butterfly from fairly early in spring. They should be coming out any time now, um, but even right quite late on into the autumn. So they don't seem to have distinct generations like most butterflies have, but they can sort of stagger, stagger things. So you can find them um, through a good part of the year. So I'm going to show you a few um, day flying moths now. Um, just seeing how we're doing for time. <clears throat> what time are we on? Okay. <laughs> um, so emperor moth. So again, this is one that should be out coming out anytime soon. Um, so usually your sighting of an emperor moth will be an orange blur flying past at high speed if you're up and um, typically on heather moorland um, is where we usually find them here. So you see the male has these orange hind wings here and it's not when it's, it's using these eye spots perhaps to deter predators. In fact, when I, interestingly, when I put this photo into the the PowerPoint presentation, it comes up with these suggestions, these alternative texts, and it said a picture of a, a squirrel is what it, it thought it was because of the eyes, maybe because of the orange colour. So that kind of amused me a bit. Um, but yeah, it could be that, you know, it can be the first glance, you just see these big eyes. So, um, so that might, you know, make some birds or other would be predators perhaps think twice. <laughs> get scared off. And the male, can you see it's got these lovely feathery antennae, so that's very important for it to be able to find a mate. So this one is actually, the female is tucked in behind, but they are actually paired up there in this picture. So she'll sit around in the heather producing her pheromones, chemical scent, to attract in the male. And here's the female. So slightly less colourful, a little bit larger, but she still has the eye spots. And that's an Empromoth caterpillar, which you might sometimes come, come across that if you're out, out walking. Um, and they're very, very distinctive when it's, you know, grown to a <clears throat> large size. And some of the cocoons as well, tip, um, very conical shaped cocoons that are spun on the heather. So yes, there they are often feeding on the on the heather here, but they, they do use other food plants too. Now another moth that's quite similar in some respects to the emperor moth, but is much, much um, more restricted in its range, Kentish Glory, which sadly is no longer found in Kent, where it was where first given its um, English name anyway, um, and used to be quite widespread in parts of England as well, but sadly no more. So now they're in this country anyway, they're restricted to um, parts of the Scottish Highlands um, and the Murray Firth area. Um, and the food plant is, is birch, but they're very, very fussy, which um, is perhaps why they've become so restricted and they only lay their eggs on young birch. So typically where you've got birch regenerating so we've got some eggs here, and these eggs are almost ready to hatch when they go to this dark colour and they're kind of dimpled. And, and then I went back to this same twig um, a couple of weeks later, and these are the caterp caterpillars alike when they first emerge. Little tiny black, black things. But eventually they turn into very fat green caterpillars. But then, although they're very big by that stage, and even if you know the tree that the eggs were laid, and that's where the caterpillars will be, they blend in very, very well with the, the birch leaves that are fully out by that time. So they can be quite difficult to find. 
and then they turn into these stunning moths here. So the male here is on the left and the female who's much bigger on the right. So the Kentish glory also has orangey hind wings, similar to the um, emperor moth, but obviously the patterning is different. Um, but I'm just gonna try and show you now another very short video clip. Let's see if this will play. So this is a male Kentish glory who's just discovered a female. Now I was for, fortunate enough to witness this last year on the year of Dinit. And um, so, and I actually, we'd come across a couple of females um, that had recently emerged because the wings were not in the normal postures. They were still drying their wings and then eventually folded the wings up and then it must have been within 20 minutes that the male appeared. In fact, for the other female had found as well. So they both paired successfully. So as soon as she's ready, she starts pumping out her pheromones and these male Kentish glories can detect them for perhaps you know, a couple of kilometers or even a couple of miles away, um, which is amazing really. So, um, so yeah, that was something you don't see every day, but again, if you know where to look, you can find these moths. But something myself, and um, I'll just let it run one more time. Go back to that. I think Nick, Nick Picotzes, I think I spotted Nick, Nick there um, at the beginning. Um, so both of us have been out with artificial pheromone lures that have been developed for this moth to try and find more places, you know, where the moths are present. So eventually after, you know, a couple of years where they weren't working so, so very well, um, the scientists um, down in Kent that were developing them actually managed to get the formula right. So we were going out with these lures and then finding the, the male moths coming in, but they're not gonna be commercially available. Um, I very much doubt because otherwise people, too many people might be going out trying to find this quite rare moth and then distract them from finding their real target that they should be looking for. All right, let me try and go back to the um, next slide. Let's go to the next one now. Okay, so um, code a few more moths now that you might find in, in some of our upland areas. Um, Again, if you know where to look, netted mountain moth. Um, this is actually really quite a small moth and easily overlooked, but it's associated with bearberry heath. Um, that's the only food plant for the caterpillars is bearberry, but it can look quite similar. There's another moth called the common heath. I don't actually have a photo here, but so you do kind of have to get your eye in to look for the differences in, in markings. Um, but this one still seems to be doing quite well up here. It seems to be fairly widespread where you've got the right habitat, but not so much this one. This is a small dark yellow underwing, which again is another one only, only feeds on bearberry as a caterpillar. Um, but there are still some spots where we've been finding these. So, so both of those netted mountain moth and this one um, during May is the peak time to go and look for them. Um, this one is actually a little bit faded and worn, so if it was fresh, the yellow underneath underwing would actually be much brighter than that. But you know, I tr I chased this one for quite some time until it actually eventually stopped and I could get a photo. But too often you you'll just see a blur of a moth going by, and at the same time, and sometimes in the same place, you might get this one broad bordered white underwing which is a bit more widespread um, and it feeds on heather and other, some of the other upland plants as well. So it's a bit more widespread for that. And it also occurs at some higher altitudes, but the two moths do overlap um, about the same size, but it does have the white underwings here. And then there's also this one, which very aptly you know, beautiful yellow underwing. So, this one usually comes out a little bit later, so it may not overlap necessarily with the small dark yellow underwing and the forewings look quite different. But again, if you're just seeing a, a blur of a small yellowish 
orangey thing in flight, then it might be a bit hard to tell. But this one, this is a ruby tiger, um, so one of the tiger moths. And this, um, <clears throat> this is actually relatively common and um, typically seen during the daytime, um, active during the day, though they do sometimes come to light traps at night. But I probably see the caterpillars there on the left more often than the moths. So the caterpillar here, this was taken this year back in March on one of those sunny days where it was just basking. Another caterpillar that likes to sunbathe. Um, and it's um, probably an important part of its development as well. So the caterpillars can be brown or ginger or black, but always the same color of, of um, pears. So that's something you might come across even if you don't see the moths. There, another a mating pair. And also in the tiger moth group, and these are using these um, often red or other bright colours to say, you know, I taste nasty, don't eat me. Um, so a redneck footman. And this has uh, only arrived in the northeast in the last few years. Um, and actually the first record of it was I found this caterpillar on the right, which dropped into a moth trap that I ran in the old wood of drum um, in the autumn. And, um, and I put the caterpillar up on a, a tree, the oak tree, it was nearby, and it immediately it started eating some lichen on the tree. So that was a clue, because I thought, I have no idea what this caterpillar was. Um, but the footmen are one of um, a group of moths that eat lichens as caterpillars. So, so eventually I found out what it was. So, but then I think the following year, then somebody had the first record of the moth here. So often in damp, damp areas, but, you know, it can be woodland areas. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a really stunning, stunning little moth. So that's another one to keep, keep your eye out, out for. So it's quite distinctive. And then also in this group is the cinnabar. Um, so this one, it's still very restricted in its range up here. It's only so far been found on the coast. Um, it was at St. Cyrus, I think, for established there for quite a long time, but in the last few years, it's been spotted up as far as Forvey. Um, so, but, so anywhere up the coast, we've got ragwort, which is its caterpillar food plant. So it's actually synthesizing the alkaloids from the food plant to make actually make itself um, so that they're distasteful to predators. So it can be, you know, stand out quite obvious like this and a lot of things won't, just won't touch them. And similarly, six pot burnets. So the burnets are another different family of the moths, but this one, I'm sure many of you have seen these particularly around the coast, but they are in some places inland and could be spreading as well because they have turned up in um, quite a few different places now, even quite, quite far inland. But again, they're, they're feeding here on ragwort. So ragwort is a really good, good plant to, you know, look for some of our day fly moths as well as butterflies in, in late summer. And you can sometimes see big aggregations of um, you know, when they're all emerging. And almost as soon as a female comes out of a pupa, I don't know if you can see the papery cocoon on the right hand picture there. And the little black sticking out is actually the pupil case. So as a female comes out again, she'll be, um, the female, uh, males will very soon detect her. Um, and sometimes you'll get several pairs around together. I think that was up a troop head. I took that actually. We just managed to time that right. We'd gone up to see the gannets as well, obviously, but uh, um, good place for the six spot burnets as well. And that's the caterpillar on the left. And this is another bird's foot trefoil one. So that's the caterpillar food plant. So if you've got common blues, you might see six spot burnets as well. But we also have this one, mountain of scotch burnet, which is a, a mountain specialist. And, um, and in the UK, it's only known from a uh, scattering of hills in the Braemar area. So it's really very restricted. Um, so there could be various factors. It could be a climatic factor as well as food plant. So crowberry is certainly the main food plant. It perhaps feeds on some of the other plants as well. This one, this is a female here 
next to her cocoon, which was formed on the heather, but there was crowberry nearby as well. So, um, but Mar Marone Hill is one of the easiest places to see them. Um, so from late June into early July is the best time to see these. Um, but there are other hills where they've been found and some surveys were done again last year to try and find some more sites for this moth and just to monitor them, monitor them see how they're doing. So being a very much a, a montane species, this is one where there are concerns with climate change, so where we've got new things arriving here, but species like this may be under threat that, you know, if it just actually gets too warm for them. The Northern Dart is another um, montane moth. Um, I think I was with, with Nick when I took this photo up in Colada. And we just happened to come across it, I think probably disturbed it and it flew up, but they can be active during the daytime. So if any of you are going to like to go up in the, in the hilltops. So this is one in, that you find around July time and it has a two year life cycle. So quite a lot of our upland species maybe only emerge every two years or sometimes even longer than that. They can delay their emergence. So the mountain burnet is also known to that it can do that as well. So if one season the weather's just not suitable, then they'll just stay tucked up in their pupa for, for another season. But then all the dart seems to have a regular two-year two -year life cycle. Fox moth. Um, this is one that you'll we'll start to see in, yeah, from May, May June time. Um, and another little bit like the Emperor's and Kentish Glory, and you'll see these males whizzing around at high speed. Um, moorland areas, also by the coast as well. Um, it's also one that has a preponderance to lay its eggs in moth traps. <laughs> and so then you feel a little bit responsible and you try and rear them. So I have reared, reared through reared some fox moth caterpillars, but it's this, these caterpillars you may well come across as well if you're out and about. So some of the early um, in stars um, stages of the caterpillar have these orange hoops and then later they change a little bit um, to like how it looks this one looks on the right flavory is one of the food plants but they do feed on on other things as well and then a little bit later the oak egger or northern egger as it's known up here was thought to be a subspecies of the oak egger but um, a bit more of a, a form now um, so again, it's another caterpillar you might come across. And then later in the summer, so July, probably the peak time for these, or June, July, and you'll see the males will be whizzing around um, and seeking out females. So again, you can see he's got these fancy antennae for finding females as well. Um, and I have a still good memory of um, when I worked at Balmoral and we used to sometimes go and um, um, be looking at um, out for merlins there. So where the, some of the merlins that were nesting had a plucking post and there was one year and we found a whole pile of northern egger moth wings that the merlins had been feeding on and discarded the wings. So, um, but it's uh, again certain years where you seem to get more moths emerging than, than other years. So, so I guess some years the merlins will be feasting on them and other years not, not so much. The vaporer, this is one to spot in the autumn. So it's another one, the male will fly around. Um, if you see a wee orange moth flying around, sometimes go, they'll fly quite high up um, around August, September time, then chances are it's a vaporer. And on the right is the female who has just very stunted, tiny, tiny wings. So she can't fly and she's really there. She's just, she's a bag of eggs, basically. So she's totally reliant on her pheromones to attract the male and mate. And then often, typically she will lay her eggs on the cocoon that she's just emerged from. Um, so not much of a life for a female vapor, but that's how it works for them. So the eggs are actually in this state over winter. So they must be pretty hardy because, you know, they can be set as out in moorland um, in all weathers. And, um, and then the caterpillars will hatch in the spring. And then here's a full grown caterpillar here on the heather. They, they use other plant, woody plants as well. 
um, but it's a stunning caterpillar. Again, lots of defenses, the hairs against predators. Right, there's a few more slides. Am I still okay, David? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, a few more, few more to go. So. Okay. Uh, magpie moth, so uh, I wonder if anyone spotted this one. So very, very distinctive. Um, this is one that's been making a comeback in our area and both on heather moorland. So there are some populations on the heather, um, but there are others, if any of you grow gooseberries or currants, um, then the caterpillars will feed on those as well. Um, so they have been spotted in, I think on Benahee in the last few years. and. Uh, but also in lowland areas where they're most probably on the um, gooseberries or currants. So keep your eyes peeled for magpie moths. A chimney sweeper, um, <laughs> great name, moth, moth, so many moths have got great names. Um, really, really black when freshly emerged, just with little white wing tips here. Um, and this one, can be quite widespread grasslands that has pig nut. Pig nut is the caterpillar food plant, so you won't find it anywhere else, but you can sort of see, see several of them um, in the right habitat during the summertime, so peak, peak of summer. Lattice teeth. Um, this is one, again, that's, that's colonized probably in, in the last 20 years or so, I think, um, but it's lovely netted kind of checkered pattern. Um, and this one lays its eggs on plants like clovers and trefoils um, as well. As does the Mother Shipton. Now, M Mother Shipton um, was actually a, a Yorkshire witch. And if you look carefully at the wing markings in this, you might be able to see what looks like maybe the face of an old crone with a big hooked long nose. Um, so, um, so again, may, maybe the moth has got these patterns that, you know, we, we perceive that there's, there's a face there and maybe some, you know, animals can as well. Um, this is quite, quite local, um, certainly not one you come across everywhere, but again, on nice species rich grasslands, you know, you can find this, this moth flying around by the day. There's actually, there's a little black ant there that maybe gives you an idea of scale. It's just um, up to the um, top left of the moth. Silver Y, um, and probably you know, virtually everybody's seen Silver Ys at some point. You might not have recognized it, but these will again come in with the migrants like painted ladies and red admirals. So they can't survive our winters here. Um, at least not at the moment anyway. But sometimes you get huge influxes. Um, I think they, they even managed to stop play, I think almost uh, there was a football match, I think it was in Paris or something, but um, there was a huge, there was an invasion, pitch invasion of silver Ys. <laughs> so, but it's got this wonky Y shaped mark on the wing. So that's its distinctive feature. Um, but yeah, you'll often see, they don't often, well, they do stop to like this. This one has stopped for a breather, but often you just get this whir of wings um, around the flowers. So they're just busy nectaring all the time. Now, narrow border bee hawk moth. Um, this was, um, I saw this for the first time just last year, last spring. Um, and there has been a scattering of sightings across Aberdeenshire and the Northeast for a number of years, but nobody really knew where they were coming from, where they were breeding. Um, they will turn up in gardens to nectar on flowers. But last year, a family were, I think they were having a picnic or they were on their bikes. They were down um, by the Dina Dinnet and um, two young lads and both quite keen on, on wildlife and managed to spot this moth. And they managed to get a picture as well and, and a video, I think. And, um, and it was, it was very early as well. It was very early sighting. And uh, so anyway, a few, a few others of us duly went back to that site and found the moth subsequently a number of times. And also the food plant devil's bit scabious of the caterpillar. So we're very sure that that is a breeding site there. And since then, some other sites have been found where I think one or two people have actually managed to find the caterpillars as well. Um, but it's amazing. It, it 
you know, it, you, know you might easily mistake it for a for a bumblebee if the thing's flying past. So it has that kind of bumblebee build, it even makes a slight buzz, buzzy kind of noise. Um, so and looking like a bee, you might get left alone by the predator if the predator thinks that you might get might it might get stung. But yeah, a really stunning, stunning little moth. Bird cherry ermine. So I'm just, just going to finish with um, a few micro moths. So sometimes micro moths tend to be overlooked because they are typically small in size. And um, the bird cherry ermine, even if you've not seen the moth, you might have noticed the webs on the bird cherry trees. Some years you get a huge influx of them um, and the conditions are just right um, for a successful year for them, maybe a less successful year for the, the bird cherries, but the trees nearly always recover um, amazingly. So later in the summer, it will start to grow new leaves. Um, so the caterpillars weave these webs um, of silk to protect themselves and, uh, and feed inside, inside their silken tents. And the moth, very pretty little moth um, that emerges later in the summer. Yeah, a couple of different ones here, just some different examples. Nettle tap. Um, so this is another is a nettle feeding moth, and um, in its caterpillar stage. But it's a very distinctive. It, the adults feed on flowers, and they almost tend to run around the flowers. They make little jerky movements. So it's very very distinctive. So there's not nothing else really in our area anyway that that does that. So that's one to look to look out for. And if you're near. Um, water near ponds, then brown china mark, um, the caterpillar is aquatic, so they actually spin together leaves of like floating pond weed and then feed inside that to feed on other pond weed leaves. Um, but it's a rather pretty moth that emerges. So yes, we even have aquatic caterpillars. And then you get some weird and wonderful shapes as well. So this one, um, Cuckoo flower longhorn, it's probably not generally known as that, but that's um, it's, um, its food plant. Um, so a lot of the micros don't have common names, but, but it's some of them are being given common names now. But these incredibly long antennae, and the males have longer antennae than the females. Again, it must be something to do with, you know, it needs them to be able to perhaps detect the females as well. Um, but yeah, raising the moths. And the one on the right, an example of one of the plume moths, um, which hardly looks like a moth at all at first glance, but just these very, very narrow wings. And this one is a time specialist. So um, very, very localized up here. But I think that is my last slide, apart from just with some more information here for anyone that's interested. Um, so, Butterfly conservation, they're also our national charity, um, interested in butterflies and moths. So lots of really good information on the kind of Scottish pages. So there are various ID and habitat and species guides. So I actually worked to develop one for Northeast Scotland um, a few years ago. So that's one of the ones that's available for the butterflies. And it does give some suggested sites to to visit as well. They're all kind of like easy to access sites. Um, and in their latest newsletter, um, there is information about some of the priority species surveys that anybody can, can take part in them there as well. And the East Scotland branch has its own web pages, but they actually host some useful maps with distribution maps for our butterflies and moths. And all you kind of need to know about recording whether you're already recording some way or getting started in recording butterflies and moths and more detailed picture though they're not fully up to date at the moment on the Nesbrek website you can look up a species on there um, and see where they've been found and then there are easy surveys to take part in like the garden butterfly survey um, where I think you need to <clears throat> at least once a month anyway but you can contribute more often than that if you want to. And the moth, moth night this year is um, in May, over a weekend in May, but again, anybody can submit any moth records over from that particular weekend. 
and then there are various events available. I'll, I'll be running a few events this year, which will be also Aberdeenshire Council range events to some of them will be. Um, but, but yes, the, the BC website has an events page there. And if there's things that you've missed, so quite a lot of um, obviously their workshops and gatherings, things have been online. So you can find some of those on that, that link there as well. And if any of you are Facebook users, um, particularly Scottish butterflies, East Scottish moths, Facebook pages um, are really useful. And if you're a keen photographer, you know, you can share photos on there. And if anybody's interested, um, I do occasional email updates um, with news of things like events and surveys just in our local area. So that's just my email address there. So that's that's me. So I'm sorry if I've rambled on. I could ramble on all, all night about butterflies and moths, but 